Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, after a long hiatus and the beginning of a new year, it is my pleasure to welcome back to YouTube today, Cadigorous! Now, Caddy, please tell us, how are you feeling? Are you ready for 2019? Yeah! That's great, because here's how it starts. What are you playing at? Why have I got to do this? What? Do I look like a fool to you? Happy New Year, everyone. <coughs> welcome back, my ass. Welcome back, my ass. I haven't had such a cold welcome back to anything before since the last time I forgot to add hot water to my bath and jump right on in. The neighbors thought I sat on the cat. I mean, come on, Sony. I built my entire career on YouTube off of the games that occupy the PS1. The great and the terrible. The iconic and the desperate. The games that I was raised on and helped mold me into the person that I am today. Yeah, I learned a lot of life lessons from Ape Escape. So to see how blatantly bad the PlayStation Classic turned out to be after so much promise and a brilliant teaser showing off five of the 20 games featured that were all a pretty damn great start doesn't even make me angry, just totally apathetic to the whole thing. I'm sure many of you out there are expecting me to get totally enraged over this thing, but to be honest, I just don't have the heart for it today. And sometimes that can be a worse sensation than being completely fueled by hate over something. It's like my teachers always said to me, I'm not angry. I'm quite drunk. And I couldn't believe I would be saying this today. I mean, after all, not only were PlayStation themselves kind enough to send me the PS Classic in time for Christmas with my own special Christmas card, <laughs> but even after tearing through the adorable custom wrapping paper to feast my gaze on the packaging for this thing, my god, this is like junk food for my eyes. I'm just gonna spoil it for you right now, they put more effort into this retro-styled nostalgic packaging than they did for the bit of plastic bum inside it. And once you get the thing out itself, admittedly, it is just as cute to me as the NES Classic and SNES Classic. It's the system that defines my childhood, but babyfied. I can't handle it. Even the controllers, despite being basic USB wired controllers, have custom ends so it doesn't feel out of place plugged into the mini little thing. Even the SNES Classic doesn't do that. But the rest of it is a load of old. To start with, the thing didn't even work for me initially, and to show you in a little bit more detail as to what I mean, we have to make our way over to the telly, okay? So, the PS Classic. It's there. Do you see it? Okay, so usually the system would have a small glowing orange light to let you know that it's on standby mode, but my light isn't on. Why is this? Because it isn't plugged in yet. <laughs> What is plugged in is my SNES Classic. It's connected directly to the USB port of my TV, and that is enough to get it to- Oh, yep, there it goes. It's on. How lovely. When it comes to the PS Classic, though, well, we need to go behind my TV with my special plug cam so you can see me working on it in real time. So here we are with the plug cam and- So here we are with the maximum fire hazard cam, and as you can see, right now the SNES Classic is plugged into the TV. You saw it working a second ago with it like that. But what happens when I switch the cable around to the USB plugged into the PS Classic? A big load of fat, useless nothing. Who made this? Soldier boy. Yeah, the PS Classic doesn't work with the power off of my TV or any other USB device. The only way for me to get this thing working was by plugging it into the mains with a USB adapter, which I just so happen to already have. But this is a major flaw in the design of the thing right out the box. The SNES Classic doesn't come with a USB mains adapter, yet works perfectly well directly off of my TV's USB slot. The PlayStation Classic doesn't come with a USB mains adapter, and yet doesn't work at all without it plugged into a wall. I know they're assuming we'd all have spare adapters in our modern homes, but if that's the case, why include a HDMI cable. I've got so many HDMI cables lounging around my house I could hang myself with them, but adapters are not as common as you'd assume, Sony. Enough complaints though, we haven't even started the thing yet, so let's boot up the PS Classic and see how much better it could possibly get. Yeah, even I must admit that the PS Classic boots up as perfectly as I could have ever imagined. It's simple and probably means nothing to a lot of you, but this is everything to me. And as soon as the system loads up the main menu, it crashes into a brick wall and piss off Mars and out. This thing has possibly the blandest damn menu I have ever seen in my life. I know it's trying to replicate the BIOS menu when you boot up the PS1 without a disc inside, but to be honest, not only did I not grow up with this ugly runt of an art style, our pal PS1 my family had looked like this, but would it have killed to have some music or something at least? 
list. Anything to give this any character that it rightfully deserves? Hell, it would have been better if they made the menu look like my old PS1 demo discs from magazines years ago and used the songs that were on those discs. <laughs> Compare this again to the SNES classic, you turn it on and are immediately smacked in the face with its charm. It's not only a vastly superior user interface with a better layout, but listen to that upbeat giddy music. Look at the amount of things going on. The SNES classic embraces its heritage and makes something new and unique from it that you just wouldn't get from basic emulation on a PC. This? This just doesn't cut it. I've seen plug-in and play sets that have more effort put into its presentation, and that's including the Spider-Man one where you move him around with his DONG! Even with the SNES Classic, you can pick different borders and backgrounds for the games for yet more charm and character to your experience. You can order the list of games on the menu based on lots of different criteria, turn on screen burn in reduction if your TV is susceptible, and even make the games look like they're running on an old CRT TV. The PS Classic? Well, you can not only turn the entire system off if it hasn't been used for longer than 60 minutes, but also DIM THE SCREEN OFF! After five minutes. Whoa! Slow down, Sony! And that's it. I'm not joking, that's all you can do with this thing. And so even though all the games have the same 720p output that the SNES Classic has, you'll find that the PS Classic just doesn't do much else besides, well, run the games. I am also fully aware that emulation on a PC itself isn't legal legal, but you'll find- But you'll find with things like this is that you're paying more for the novelty of the thing than the value of having all the games on one package. So my question is, why not make the thing that you're paying for more novel? I mean, why don't you make what you have a better option by default than emulation? You know what else emulation has over this thing? Save states. This thing only has one save state per game. One save state per game. It does have a virtual memory card built in, but come on, the SNES Classic once again surf and turfs you out of the salad bar with four save states being available along with built-in save options if the games included allowed it. Perhaps we should have a look at the games on the little grey grandma then and see if that saves it in any way, shape, well, I'm very sorry, but that is what you buy this thing for over anything else. The games. So let's see if the official set list can save it in any way at all. This console had better start getting good or I'm gonna leak out of all my holes. Well, immediately we know this isn't gonna be the best way to play many of these games by default since there are no analog sticks on the controllers bundled with the system. Which not only means that games like Ape Escape or RC Stunt Copter wouldn't have made it on here, period, but also means that other games that potentially benefit from analog control, like Siphon Filter or Metal Gear Solid, don't have that option out of the game. Let's give it a fair shot though, onto the games. Number one, Battle Arena. Thank you. Well, to begin with, I don't think I've ever seen a versus match be labeled on the main menu as versus human before. Sounds like the console <laughs> itself is alive. But following that, I'm not too sure about these characters either. Sophia looks like someone glued a Barbie head on a sandcastle, and I don't think I need to say anything about foe. Where's his chin? What's he looking at? Is that a moustache or a fish stuck up his nose? Okay, well, I personally can't let go of how much I love foe's foes, and my stepdaughter is going with Duke, who looks like he's saying his own name, like Duke. Our battle begins, and oh wow, oh my good god, holy shit. I'm so sorry to any Battle Arena Toshinden fans out there, but I feel like I'm controlling a dump truck stuck in a valley of jam. <laughs> no matter what either of us do, we can't get the game to respond to our inputs in a reliable way. It's the stiffest 3D fighter I've ever played, and I'm saying that as someone who's played Tekken 1, which funnily enough, came out on the same year for the PS1. <laughs> What's going on here? I can appreciate how the game looks and the amount going on with being able to sidestep in and out of the environment, that's pretty ahead of its time, but this is at the expense of how hitboxes work and responsive button inputs. And I must question the body proportions of Rongo here. He's either hidden a mattress up his shirt or has bigger breeds than Lara Croft. I know we both don't know how to play the game at all, but I equally know nothing about how Street Fighter works, but can still jump into a match and enjoy myself. This game is just a slog to me, no thank you. But if you're curious, this is worth a look if you ever wanted to play a game as Wolverine's left nut. <laughs> Laugh at me like that one more time and I'll see you in court. Game number two, Cool Borders 2. I actually made a video about Cool Borders 3 a long ass time ago and absolutely couldn't stand it. So with this being the game that preceded it when the company had even less of a clue of what they were doing, yeah, yeah, I didn't like this game either. If I couldn't get my character to jump off of a ramp, I then could, but then wasn't able to move in midair to perform any tricks or I just glitched the camera out. Otherwise, on the racing side of things, I'm sorry, Cool Borders fans, I just don't get this series and I never will. This is me trying to play the game to the best of my ability. This 
This is me trying to get speed and the game keeping me at eighth place indefinitely no matter what I do. This is me trying to make remotely sharp turns and the game just not allowing me to do that because of one particular button being pushed down that shouldn't be even though you need to slow down and speed up accordingly with the same buttons. Ugh, no. This is not what I think of when I see the words PlayStation and Classic together. Bugger off. Game 3, Destruction Derby. I've said this so many times and will say it once again. This is not only the worst of all the Destruction Derby PS1 games, but perhaps the most boring racing game I've ever played, and I don't get the undying love for it when people fondly remember the glory days of the PS1. This is a very early 3D racer, and hot damn does it feel like it. No matter what track and what car I pick, Destruction Derby 1 never reaches any peak of excitement even close to what 2 or Raw are able to accomplish. And even worse, it never seems to make sense because sometimes I get points for wrecking the other cars, but most of the time I don't. Cap this off with bland, repetitive music that never fits the mood of wrecking cars, and you get a game that's fun for around three minutes before making you want to quit it before even finishing lap five of an eight lap rip. <laughs> Game 4, Final Fantasy 7. Now this is going to surprise you all. When I first played this game years back, I got about 3 hours into it and totally gave up. It just wasn't gripping me. I even brought this up in the PS1 series of Normal Boots Madness I did recently. So why is it that after all this time with no major interest to revisit it, I'm suddenly getting really hooked and want to keep the game going. If it weren't for the time I needed to make this video, I would have kept playing this honestly to see if I could see something in it a second time around, but until then, stay cool Final Fantasy 7. I'm sure I'll pick you up off of the shelf before you go sour. Also, for most people, you can't think of PlayStation without thinking of Final Fantasy 7. The game is as iconic as can bloody be, so it makes perfect sense for it to be on here. Hang on a second, can I just boot that game up again quickly? Licensed by Sony Computer Entertainment America. But wait, the last three games before this were all European. Are you shitting me, Sony? Are you pushing me out of your rectal cavity? If you don't know why this is a bad thing, well, with European PAL games back in the day, like the ones I have on my shelf, they were released at the time at 50 hertz to comply with the TVs we had available at the time. American NTSC games and identical copies of the same games ran at a much smoother and faster 60 hertz, which you can see in something as simple as Crash Bandicoot. The game runs fine on PAL systems, but once you see how it's supposed to run on American systems, the issues become abundantly clear. PAL games are more choppy and slower by default, and the PS Classic in the most baffling move I've ever seen for a Retro Classics collection actually mixes in European and American versions of these games on the same damn console. Meaning some games run like they should and others feel like a goddamn slideshow in comparison, especially when playing on a big TV, and I can't fathom a single logical reason as to why this was done. At this point, with so many European games on here, I could just grab them off my shelf, pop them in my PS3 and then play them that way in HD with wireless controllers, chances to have up to four players, analog sticks, more game selection and with more options to play with to suit my needs. Oh, well, I mean, obviously, minus the <coughs> singular save state. This is even funnier to think about when hackers discovered you can simply plug a USB keyboard into the PS Classic itself, enter a debug menu by just hitting the escape key, and actually choose the regions for games on the system. Why not just have them all at NTSC by default? And you know what? I'm not going to do that because I'm judging this thing as it was given to me off of the shelves. And because of that, I feel like I bought myself a really nice burrito but it had a fresh turd in it. Next game on the lineup, number five, Grand Theft Auto, which I found surprisingly fun. I've never played the original GTA before, but I really want to give it another go. It's like Micro Machines. <laughs> and once again, if I had a little bit more time, I would have kept playing. The driving physics are fun, the writing is dark and witty, it doesn't look half bad for a PS1 game, and my god, you know you're playing one of the best games ever made when you have to accelerate your main character running around the street by pushing the X button. Game number six, Intelligence Cube, also known as Kurushi in PAL regions. <laughs> I've said this many a time before and stand by my views. This is a great puzzle game for the PS1 and one of the most memorable for me personally. However, I can only get around 5-10 to 10 minutes of enjoyment of it at a time before getting all itchy and wanting to shave my eyebrows off. I will always remember this game from my childhood though. If not for the simple and addictive nature, then for some of the most daunting sound effects for a puzzle game I've ever heard in my life. Number 7, Jumping Flash, a game that has dated by a fair amount with the advent of first person games just being better as technology has increased, but still a fascinating little ride for anyone looking to get into PS1 and well worthy being on this system. I was able to jump in and have a blast with this straight away like I always have done every time I replay this game, while at the same time appreciate all that it did for the games of its genre, especially for the year 1995. This must have blown people away back in the day. And somehow it controls decently and it's pretty clear where to go and what to do. It's amazing. It's cute, engaging. 
artistically unique, has a totally balling soundtrack, and you're a cybernetic rabbit flying around shooting frogs in top hats. What's not to love? Game 8, Metal Gear Solid. Do I even need to try explaining why this game was included on this console? It must be pretty obvious by this point. Metal Gear Solid 1 was considered by many to be one of the best games, if not the best game ever made when it first came out. And if Crash Bandicoot or Final Fantasy 7 didn't say it to the PS1, this game did. I'm also thrilled to report that even though I only jumped in for 10 minutes or so, it's still a really damn fun and tense game to play despite the limitations. Don't need to say much else, it's bloody Metal Gear Solid. Number 9, Mr. Driller. <laughs> Okay, well this is a game that far from springs to my mind the second I think of the word PlayStation, but I'm sure I can give it a fair shot. I've never even heard of this game before until now, but yeah, I'll give it a fair shot. Well, I would give it a fair shot if this game wasn't 20 decibels louder than every other game on this plastic grey paperweight. Why this game in particular is so loud, don't ask, I have no idea. Although my theory is that if the music didn't kick you in the sack the second you booted it up, you wouldn't remember the game at all otherwise, so congrats on that, Sony. I will never forget Mr. Driller ever again. And that's because the game itself is... Well, it's it's fine. It's a game. You run around and try to dig your way to the bottom of a mine shaft, all the while trying not to let the above platforms and materials fall on your head and being quick enough to grab air so you can keep on drilling down. That's really all this game is. It's like Dig Dug, but without Sonic the Hedgehog inflation. I mean, even if there were some people out there that considered this a PS1 classic, good on you, I guess, but... Really? The game's fine, there's nothing really wrong with it, but there's also nothing really that much to it, and because of that, I'm bored now. Game 10, Oddworld Abe's Odyssey. Now, I really would have preferred Abe's Exodus personally for all the extra features and vast amount more game to it, but I mean, it's goddamn Abe's Odyssey. I would have kicked and screamed if any kind of Oddworld game didn't end up on this collection. They're PlayStation royalty as far as I'm concerned, and Abe's Odyssey is one of the most unique artistic visions in video games ever made with some of the coolest and out there game mechanics of its time, let alone just on the PS1. And I suppose the major issue with it causing frustration, being the lack of quick saves that Abe's Exodus has, is mitigated by the save state feature built into the console, so aside from emulating it, this is probably the best way to play the first aid game as it is. Hello. Hello. Follow me. Okay. Game 11, halfway there, Rayman 1. I did a full video about this game a while back, and where I love half of it, the other half is some of the most trial and error cow deposit I've ever experienced in a platformer. However, I can understand its inclusion as a PS1 classic. Lots of people associate Rayman 1 with it, and unfortunately Rayman 2 on PS1 isn't the best version of that particular game. So yeah, I do get this choice even though I'm not the biggest diehard fan of it. Oh wait, what? Oh no, what is going on here? Oh my god, <laughs> really? Okay, I know this is one of the US USA region ROMs, but what the hell is going on with this snagging in the gameplay? I never got this while I played it on my emulator, so what's going on here? Rayman is too beautiful of a game to be subjected to this. I wasn't too interested to get far into this game for this video, but now I feel like I'm losing my eyesight. Next game. Number 12, Resident Evil. Well, I mean, aside from it being the choppier PAL version, this is as untouched and pure Resident Evil 1 can be. It's got all the great gameplay, all the great atmosphere, all the great voice acting, master of unlocking, and even got the version different from the PS Store with the correct and much better soundtrack. Let me take care of this. Thank the Lord for that. Game number 13, Persona. So this is the first game ever in the Persona series that I do own the fourth of on Vita, but have yet to play. Once again, I didn't have anywhere near enough time to properly dig into it, but I can tell you two things. One, I thought the art style was really cool, and two, I was absolutely smitten by this world the game gave me. I had no clue what was going on, but I was so desperate to see where it was going, and it was kind of spooky, actually. Especially when the most slender of men appeared out of thin air and started talking at me about monsters that live inside you like alien, but not quite like alien, because it's actually magic and not- My name is Philomar. What? Philomar. Philomar? Philomar. Ah, right, okay, I've got you. Hm. I could swear I popped a rather nasty Philomar on the back of my neck yesterday. And when I was allowed to run around my school in first person, I gotta say it looks pretty damn impressive and runs well for early first person PS1 games, especially in something as huge as an RPG. But I mean, I'm not here to give you a review of the game. I didn't even get to any combat or whatever you do in this game. I even named my main character Crisps. That's how seriously you could see I was taking it. Crisps, are you okay? Game 14, Ridge Racer Type 4. Where I don't think this game has anywhere near the same cultural impact or iconic PS1 status as 
the other Ridge Racer games, like Ridge Racer Revolution, for instance, I can't deny that this is a very good arcade racer and arguably the best Ridge Racer for the PS1. So all things considered, I understand its inclusion. But it is just racing over and over again. Not much else I can say for now, so let's move on. I think a test drive game would have been a better option here. Game 15, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. Another puzzle game, but one of the more stand out for the system and incredibly stylish. It's basically Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, but with Street Fighter characters. And the better combos and larger connections you make with other colors, the more damage you do to your opponent. This is great fun with two players or even going against the computer. It's satisfying, has great music and sound effects, looks really damn good for it being a simple puzzle game where you're looking mainly at this and never at this. I've had this game on my shelves for a while now and I have been meaning to have a look at it, so who knows, maybe I will, this is a good one. Game 16, Siphon Filter. Now where I don't think this game is terrible, I've played a fair amount of it before and I personally wouldn't go as far as to call it a PlayStation classic. It's a little bit too dated and slippery in terms of control for me to recommend you going back to it. You know, it's very triggers run left and right while you tank control Gabe Logan running around and making ridiculously heavy turns while you try and aim at people accurately that will kill you instantly. Which is funny because this game released in 1999 and yet the original Tomb Raider came out three years before, yet despite a very similar control scheme is much more responsive and accurate. Plus it's easier to shoot things and swap through equipped weapons. Why isn't Tomb Raider on this thing? I can understand some people having fond memories of Siphon Filter, but for me, nah, this isn't classic material in my opinion. Unlike game 17, Tekken 3. Objectively the best Tekken game for the PS1, even if I have a soft and nostalgia spot for Tekken 2. It's still a blast to play, it still looks great, it still has the crazy number of combos and grabs, it still has all the additional modes and characters that make it as great as it is. It's Tekken 3, bitch. Game 18, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. Well, the first person view is very impressive and runs very smoothly for PS1. That is until I found a window, shot it and went through it, then found a wooden board, shot it and went through, and died before my feet even touched the ground. Okay. Game 19, Twisted Metal. There we go, much more PS Classic material, even though I've heard the sequels are better. You drive around and bomb other cars with missiles and machine guns in destructible environments. It's hectic, violent car mauling that Destruction Derby 1 wishes it had, and definitely fits more with the heritage of the PlayStation. I mean, the clown in the game known as Sweet Tooth even ended up in... PS All Stars. So... So you know that means it's special. And that finishes us off with game 20, Wild Arms. Once again, I've never played this one before, but Christ almighty did I want to keep going. I've heard from so many people how great this game is and how much it helped to find JRPGs on the PlayStation. And even cooler, it's set in the Wild West. Well, I assume it is. If it isn't set in the Wild West, it's Wild West and themed at least. And that soundtrack, I have only heard a few minutes of it, but God damn, it's great. I've heard people call this a PS classic all the damn time. And after only a few minutes of play, I'm hooked. So I guess they weren't talking a load of Billy Ball, a good way to close off the list of games if you ask me. But yeah, that is the whole set list of the PS Classic. Kind of just exists, doesn't it? There are some great games in there, there are some bad games in there, there are even a couple of classics in there, I'll give them that much, but none of that means anything when you consider how inconsistent this system is in terms of quality and for how much money they were asking for it when it first came out. The lesson here though after all of this is that if companies want people to stop downloading ROMs and emulating classic games from the past, make getting access to your products worth a damn. Nintendo are really stingy when it comes to selling their classic games already, but at least with the SNES Classic and even NES Classic gave you an alternate way to have a large collection of some of the best games on their systems, not only with a cute plastic emulator shell and charm in spades for the UI, but also made them both in total less than buying all of the games on the system via the Nintendo eShop. The PS Classic is simply not worth the asking price, and it definitely should not have been called the Classic. Speaking as someone who grew up with, loved to death, and is fondly nostalgic over the PS1, this doesn't take me back at all, aside from a few games on the pack that do, which I can just play on my PS3 for cheaper anyway, or even on the go with my Vita. I don't know about you guys, but I don't think PlayStation Classic and think Mr. Driller, Persona, Grand Theft Auto, or Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. And the licensing doesn't even make that much sense to me. I understand not including games like Toy Story 2 or Tony Hawk because they're actual out-of-game brands and even celebrities, so copyright must be tricky. But when they can get Konami's MGS, why can't they get Castlevania or Silent Hill? If they can get Namco's Ridge Racer Type 4, Mr. Driller, and Tekken 3, why can't they get Klonoa, one of the best PS1 games of all time? If they can get Capcom's Red Resident Evil or Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, why can't they get any Mega Man games? How about the games that everybody immediately associates with PlayStation like Crash and Spyro? The remasters are both on PlayStation systems nowadays, and the original games are still PS exclusive, so what's all that about? And hey, what about dead franchises that people would like to see return and that I can't see much licensing issue with, like Gex or Tombi? I mean, I'm not gonna pretend I know anything to do with video game politics, I'm no 
Tronald Dump. But when my PS3 has more and better options to download from PlayStation's online store, along with the ability to play some PS2 games and all PS3 games, why wouldn't I just do that? Why is Medieval on the PS Store but not on the Classic, especially with the currently PS4 exclusive remake in the works? How about Hot Shots Golf, or Everybody's Golf in the UK, or maybe even any of the Wipeout games? I mean, these are still, to this day, Sony properties. Why couldn't they use any of these? All you're paying for with the PS Classic is a plastic shell. And I'm gonna wreck it! <laughs> Actually, I think I'll just hack it. Okay, well I won't, I'm not that skilled, but thanks to this fine gentleman on Twitter, he showed me exclusive footage of the roulette wheel of games he has hacked onto his own PlayStation Classic. And since this plastic shell is too adorable to destroy for me, I think this is the next best thing I'm gonna do with it. Give the system the set list that it truly deserves. In the end though, I don't really need to say anything more about the PS Classic, other than what happened to the price of it in the UK. This thing retailed when it first came out at £89.99, which is, by the way, £20 more than what the SNES Classic cost. And I'm not even kidding, after one month of it being out, I was seeing it in sale racks for £30. And even nowadays, the base price of it has gone down significantly. It really does feel like Sony rushed this thing out to the shops to cash in on Nintendo's success with the miniature console market, and do it right before Christmas 2018 hit so it could be the perfect gift for a PlayStation fan. Personally, I wouldn't even be surprised if I found out that they had actually contacted multiple publishers and developers to get the rights for certain games to use on this thing, but because Christmas 2018 was so close and this thing really does feel like they made it at the last minute, they didn't get any phone calls or emails back in time and so just threw on whatever they could instead. And I'm not a marketer, I'm not a publisher, I'm not a developer, so I can't tell you how these things work behind the scenes, but I am just calling it as I see it. And my advice to you is don't buy it. Don't even wait for a sale of it. There's just nothing to it. There's no point wasting your money on it. But I suppose that the really dinky cute size of it makes it good for one thing. Honey, what the hell are you doing? I'm catching my poo. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Do you want to see some outtakes from today's video? There are some crackers in this one, I tell you. Well, just stay tuned for a second because I've got a few things to talk about. First of all, I'd love to thank every single person on the screen right now that has supported me via Patreon. And secondly, Notice these at all? Yeah, these new headphones on my head. Well, a couple of months ago, the guys at Sennheiser and Mastrop were incredibly kind to me and sent me a brand new pair of their brand new HD 58X Jubilee headphones. And so they are sponsoring today's video because these things are fantastic and I've been using them religiously over the last few months. If you're looking for a high-end audio experience you'd try to find in a $500 pair of headphones but want it at a much more affordable price at $150, these are the headphones that you get. They're rated five stars all over the web and are constantly selling out for a reason. They're incredibly well built, nice and solid, yet lightweight, and also they just give off this incredibly crisp, clear, yet bassy sound. Not to mention they're very comfortable and will last you many years, and I have been using Sennheiser headphones for the longest time I can remember, so I really appreciate the sponsorship, guys. These are fantastic headphones. Thank you so much. If you want to find out more about the headphones yourself, go to the link in the description below and hopefully pick yourself up a pair. And just before the outtakes come on today, special, special thanks to all the top tier Patreon supporters for this month. Omar Mat to Basil, Carl Hackinen, Gamer Man, I Have a Portal Gun, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Mills Kahai, Brandon Brandon, Binary Code, Kirsten B, Cyberpunk Symphony, Nicole Ganara, Nathan Young, Victor Patrick Bauer, Robert Alamsha, The Game Shed, Daniel Leon, Braden Kenny, Jake Delahaye 2008, Mitchell Reed, A.D. Thornton Smith, and Maximilian Ely. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people. But none of that really matters when you consider how inconsistency. Let me step back so you can see the full horror. Okay, well, let's see, I can get them yeah, yeah. up there. <laughs> it's so wrong. I love it. Yeah! If I just, I'll zoom into my head. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Yeah!